Our, Lord, our, our word is to be an active weight. And I pray, Father, that we would be a people motivated. Motivated in your word, motivated in prayer, motivated in fellowship. So once again, as we gather together tonight, I pray that you would bless us, that you would guide us through our section of Scripture, and that you would speak to us relevant for today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn and greet your neighbors? Neighbor. Doing okay, Bill? So what did you guys do that nobody wants to sit next to you? Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 44. We'll be starting at verse 1, and we'll get through to verse 21, I believe it is, tonight. 23. Now, in the last couple of chapters, we've seen, first in chapter 42, God the servant, and it spoke of the coming of Messiah. In chapter 43, we saw that God is gracious, and now tonight, starting in verse 1, we're going to look at God, our keeper, chapter 44, verse 1. Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you, fear not. And so we're told in the word of God to fear not. Back in Isaiah's day, it was coming judgment of uh, Syria, and then later on would be Babylon and all things that were contained in that. In our day, it's the hardships that we deal with and the news we have from across the world, but fear not. Now think about it. If the Lord is God and his love is genuine to the degree that he would come as a servant for all of mankind, if this was based upon his grace and not our merit, then it makes sense that God would be our keeper. We see his ability to keep us based upon his attributes that reveal the magnitude of what he is able to do. Now, just, just think of that. All that God is, all that God is, a portion of that is so that we are kept in this life, that he's able to watch over us, that he's mighty to save, and, and even in the difficult of the day, he's able to enter in. So really what I want to do before we get into the study, I want to go over to Psalm chapter 139, and I want to revisit certain attributes of God just as way of a reminder so that we would remember the ability to, of God in the midst of the attributes of God. Psalm 139 is the premier chapter of understanding the attributes of God in relationship to mankind. So first we have is... Um, God omniscient. Omniscient means that God is all-knowing. Verses 1 through 6, this is for the chief musician, a psalm of David, says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word of my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether." You have hedged me behind and before, and have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. And so the psalmist was taken by this God, this God who had hedged him or supported him uh, you know, from the rear and from the front, that this God knows him. He knows him inside out, and it's okay. See, there are certain people, maybe people that you want to impress, you'll keep certain aspects of your life from them. Certain people that you're concerned about, if they found certain information, they may do you damage, you'll keep certain things from them. But there's God, Lord God of the universe. He knows it all. He knows all of your past. He even understands your future. But nonetheless, he still hedges you. He still watches over you, and he still keeps you. So don't turn back there yet, but in Isaiah chapter... 44, we're told to fear not. See, if there's something secret that I'm keeping from God and I brought into God's family, but then it's revealed at a later time, I'm going to be very fearful. What, what if this changes the relationship? And maybe think of some of the relationships that you had that something was found out either from you or from the other party and it changed something of the relationship. 
maybe even to the degree that the relationship is no more. Well, there's no surprises with God when it comes to you. He knows it all. He's omniscient. He's also omnipresent. He's everywhere, everywhere at the same time. These are some of the things that the Lord set aside, Philippians chapter 2, when he came, when he humbled himself and came as a servant. And so, in verse 7, 7 through 12, where can I go from your spirit? Again, the question asked, the answer is going to be the negative, as in nowhere. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, now when he says into heaven, he's looking out into the sky, he's talking about as in outer space. If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, here he's talking about shale or the boat of, of death, he's talking about the depths of the earth. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. So I can't go far away and have you not be there. I can't go down below and have you not be there. If I take the wings of morning, speaking of dawn, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, the deepest parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, speaking of trials, even the night shall be like light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. God's always there, no matter what it is that we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with, God is there. Just like Jonah, Jonah was going to the ends of the earth to hide from God, and how was he getting there? Not so much even in a ship, he was in the lower part of the ship. And God not only met him there, understood what Jonah was doing, God allowed that big fish to come, and where was it that God met Jonah? It was in the belly of that big fish and so two things here wherever it is that you may find yourself God's there wherever it is that you may hide yourself God's there and it's a good thing that God is there because he's there to keep you and even deliver you so he's omniscient he's omnipresent and he's omnipotent in verses 13 through 18 he's he's all powerful for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all are written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts toward me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I was still with you. And so we see how God, especially back in, in David's day, the internal portion of a person, that was something that was just beyond. Not that they couldn't do an autopsy, but especially the baby being formed. They didn't understand that to the degree that we do today. And nonetheless, he understands that, that God was there and God was in that. And God, obviously, he created the, the whole process, but nonetheless, he was with him when he was being formed in his mother's womb. And from womb all the way through to the grave, from the cradle to the grave, God has been with them. Matter of fact, God thinks of him. God is in his days being yet, having yet to come. And so, again, as I've said so many times, and probably this is where I've gotten from it, here we are at the beginning of a new week. God's already in the midst of your week. We're always entering into what God has prepared for us. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. But the good thing about all of these things, they're based upon God being holy. Verses 19 through 24. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. And so he's wanting God to examine him. Why? Because, well, we talked a little bit about it this morning, and couple Sundays ago, there's the necessary element of our Christian faith of repentance. And he's asking God, if there's any wicked way within me, reveal it. Reveal it so that it can be dealt with. And so 
these attributes of God and the holiness of God, all these attributes are based upon the holiness of God for the purpose not of judging his people, although it will be used in the judgment, but the first priority of the purpose is to minister to God's people. It's to minister to you. God knows me and it's a good thing. That way everything gets dealt with. What if Adam and Eve were just left in the bushes with the fig leaves? They would have been judged. But God met them in the midst of their sin on the day that they were sinned for the purpose of not only their, but mankind's restoration. And so God's always working towards the restoration of the individual and mankind collectively. It's this plan. As he exists in the future, I also have to realize he exists in eternity past, and it's all for the purpose, again, of caring for his people. And so God knew me. God knew me from the womb. Now, what does that mean? That means everything I've ever done, everything I've ever said, everything that I have ever, well, committed apart from God, he understood all of that didn't agree with it, and don't get me wrong on that, but he knew who I was, and he still brought me into his kingdom. He knew who I would be, and he still brought me into the family. There needs to be a security and a confidence in that, not in us, because we're going to fail time and time again. But regardless of our failures, all because of his grace and the Lord Jesus Christ and our belief in Christ, he has brought us into his family, and he will keep us in his family. So in the face of these aspects of God's nature, mankind, mankind is apt to have one of three reactions. First, he will try and hide as Adam and Eve and as Jonah did. He'll try to run as Jonah did, apart from God's will. Or, as we need to do, we'll submit to him. Just simply submit to the will of God. Here he is with these mighty attributes for the purpose of keeping me isn't the safest place that I could possibly be in my Christian life, in my physical life, in the perfect will of God. In Psalm 144, verse 15, the last part, it says, Happy are the people, or content are the people, whose God is the Lord. And so, that being the case, I find contentment in the perfect will of the one who is all-knowing, who is ever-present, who is all-powerful, and who is holy go ahead and turn back to Isaiah. So this is he who Isaiah is speaking of, and this is he who, when he is speaking of these things, we understand the magnitude of the God who tells us to not fear. So chapter 44 needs to be looked at with the backdrop of our God who provides, protects, and will preserve us in our Christian life. And so again, first thing, verses 1 and 2, yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen, thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, uh, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Why should we be people who do not fear? After all, it is foolish to not fear unless there is a basis to not fear. If you just choose to not be fearful, that's a foolish thing. You have to have a basis to not be fearful. Our leaders have told us not to be fearful of the terrorists, but the threat is real, their agenda is clear, and their presence seems to be getting closer and closer. Every month there seems to be a new pestilence that is immune to the drugs that we have to fight it. And then there's death. There's death. It's been all over the news. Prince death. Um, Mrs. Barone, Marie Barone just died. Doris, I can't remember her last name. but um, There's death. What's that? Doris Roberts died. Um, and there's just death every day. I don't know how many people die a day, but it's there. And just to say, well, I'm not going to fear death is foolish unless you have something to base that lack of fear from. Matter of fact, the good thing about fear, as with pain, it warns us that something is wrong or something is imminent. So for the born-again believer, 2 Timothy 1.7, God's not given us a spirit of fear. We're not to be walking around in a fearful state with a fearful mind. As you open up the newspaper, you see the things that are going on and you understand, we looked at the attributes of God, that God is in control of everything that we see. When you forget, we all momentarily can forget, there can be that feeling of panic that can so easily come over us when we hear 
you know, just recently, and I think it was in Ohio, eight people were executed as they slept. One was a mother who had her four-month-old baby right beside her. And you look at those things, and you can become fearful, and you can feel vulnerable, and all of these things, but God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power, it's through his spirit, and of love, that we are to be sacrificial, people who sacrificially love as we have been sacrificially loved, and of a sound mind. And, and, and that's what really sticks out to me is a sound mind. Now, what's a sound mind based upon? It's going to be based upon the word of God. It's going to be based upon what we just saw, for instance, in uh, Psalm 139 or in Isaiah chapter 44, that we are not to fear. Sound mind. A sound mind is going to digest all of the information that we get from the word of God. It's going to compare it to the events that are going on in the world. And God says that we are not to have a spirit of fear as we do that. So we can look at the hard things that are going on and we can rationalize them according to God. We can look at death. And we can put death in its proper place, according to God. I'm going to be doing a funeral on Thursday for Anne's mother. She passed away last week. And as I'm doing it, I, I don't look forward to funerals. I look forward to doing funerals, though. I don't like to see people in heartache and, and all of that, but I see the value in it. Because, again, these people, the unbeliever, they're fearful. Because they're realizing just as surely as that person died, one day they're going to die. And again, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. They know they're sinners, they know God's righteous, and they know of an existence of God, and they know that one day they're going to be judged. And so on top of just the fact that they're going to die is the fact that they're going to be judged after they die. And so, yeah, they're very fearful, and they should be fearful. Matter of fact, I believe that God uses fear to bring them to where they need to be so when the gospel is given they would be apt to receive that which god is offering them and so i look at a funeral and i see there's rich opportunity in this so, well what's the problem you like funeral what well man apart from god is fearful of those things we don't want to talk about it we don't want to touch it matter of fact i see it's a great wrong that happens even in the christian church Somebody goes through something very hard. They lose a loved one. They, they have somebody close to them that passes away, and it's almost as if they become isolated, not from their doing, but the people around them, because we consider that person, and there's the thought, what if it happens to me? I can't tell you how many times I've heard, haven't really heard it from this church, but I have heard it that, you know what, th this hardship happened, nobody called, nobody came by. It's those people that we need to rally around and support during a week time so that, well, we are those who have that sound mind and we are to support others. So that sound mind enables me to compare the word of God to the reality of life. And because I do that, I have no spirit of fear. So here in Isaiah, the prophet bases the lack of fear that exists in our lives on three realities, three realities in our Christian life. First in verse one, our lack of fear is to be based upon the fact that God chose you. Yet hear now, O Jacob, my servant in Israel, whom I have chosen. We're told that God chose us in Ephesians chapter 1. We looked at it or mentioned it this morning. But God chose you despite who you are and how you are. So if you become insecure in your Christian life, if you become fearful in your Christian life, based upon who you are and how you are or your sinful nature understand god already knew that and he still chose you we're not to be condemned there's no condemnation for those who are in christ and so i have to preface this i'm not giving anybody a license to sin because you're not going to find contentment in this christian life but even as i do sin god already knew of the sin that i was going to commit and nonetheless, he still chose me. This is where all of our ugliness, warts, and rebellion, and imperfections are seen, but the love that God has for us is able to overcome that. Again, Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So what was his choosing based upon? First, his foreknowledge, because he chose us before the foundation of the world. That means you were always part of God's plan. But he also chose us in him. We know the in him is Christ. 
And so God chose us based upon the accomplishment of the cross. So based upon the accomplishment upon the cross at a point in time, God at the beginning of the time chose you. Chose you to come into the family of God. That being the case, why would I have fear in this life? Why would I ever especially fear God? So we are not to be fearful that he is going to find us out because he already knows everything about us. He already knows it. And it's not that he got stuck with you. It's that he purposely chose you. And if you think of, you need to think about that. You need to dwell upon, meditate upon that. Meditate upon him choosing you because there's really, again, only two people that really know who you are and how you are, and that's you and, and God. And you probably wouldn't even choose yourself, but God chose you because he loves you. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Spirit. Secondly, our lack of fear is to be based upon the fact that he formed you. Verse 2, thus says the Lord God who made you and formed you from the womb and who will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. God formed you, and part of that formation, part of the means by which God created you, or how God created you, he has created you. He didn't create you in sin, but he created you with the ability to sin. We are perfect creations in Christ. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve, they defiled it, but Adam and Eve, on the day that they were created, were absolutely perfect. Now, if you take anything that is organic, and you may have some, let's just take, for instance, you have prime rib, a choice cut of prime rib. That's about as close to perfection I can think apart from God. And so it's just how you like it and all, and so it's perfect. But if you go sit it out on the back wall for a couple of days, it's going to be defiled. God created mankind, and what did he say? It's good. But what happened? It became defiled. God created us with that free will, and there's that nature that sins. And so the, 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 the reason that I am not to be fearful of God is because God created me this way. He created me. He created you how you are with the ability to sin. And our greatest fear should be to be found out the sinners that we are. But again, if God already knows, because he's created me this way, he has not created me to be a perfect person. That's beyond my capacity. So when I fail, I need to repent. There's no doubt about that. But there should be a confidence that I don't fall into despair because I have done so. There's going to be conviction, and it's all part of the process of getting the sin dealt with, but I ought not to fear. Fear causes you to cower in the corner, or again, like Adam and Eve, to hide from God. And nowhere do I see that a born-again believer is to be hiding from God. We see that in the book of Revelation, but that's for the unbeliever. God is not surprised when you sin or to the degree that you sin. And again, this is the benefit of his attributes. Those attributes that we talked about, if you look at them all, they're all geared towards meeting man in his sinful condition. And so it is why he had a plan. He knew me in the womb. Your parents were the only ones who thought you were going to be perfect, and even they knew you were, they were lying to themselves. He had a plan because he loved you even when you were in the flesh, even when you were enmity with him. He has a plan because he understood your plight. He understood your nature. Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And then God, God who is rich in grace and mercy, he met me. He met me that one day. He met you that one day, the day of your salvation. And everything was exposed, but it was a good thing that it was exposed. Because as it was exposed, it was dealt with, and God brought you into his family. Thirdly, our lack of fear is to be based upon the fact that he has redeemed us. Verse 3, for I will pour water on him. Where am I at? No. Verse 3, yes, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty 
and floods on the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offspring. He redeemed me in that as he poured these blessings upon me, the greatest of them was, again, redemption. Redemption as I was headed for destruction, he has brought me back into his family. You were once headed for that place that was eternally apart from him, but God paid the ransom and brought you back with the price, the blood of the lamb. Again, it's all about seeing the value in you in your raw state. Just think of it, Mount Rushmore. Why did the artist who carved out that mountain, I don't don't know much about the history of Mount Rushmore, but why did the artist choose that particular mountain range? I mean, I don't know specifically, but generally it's because he saw. He saw in that mountain range what he wanted to create. It was in very rough form. I'm sure nobody else could have. Matter of fact, if the guy was going to tell you that I'm going to go carve this out with dynamite and artisans and have these faces of these presidents, you'd probably think that he was kind of crazy. But he saw the beauty in it being yet unformed. A sculptor. A sculptor just takes a block of rock and he sees the beauty in what he wants to create and in essence, is all he's doing is he's knocking out the pieces he doesn't need for the image that he's trying to make. A songwriter, he takes a bunch of words. We all know all of these words, but a songwriter is able to arrange them in such a way. Well, here at church, we're able to worship a holy God with them. Fear not, God in his foreknowledge supernaturally saw the beauty and desired the beauty in you. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me, there is no other God. There is no other God that is able or willing to work these things. When you understand these things, then you have a legitimate reason to not fear. Then you can encourage somebody who's in despair, or maybe on the edge of despair, to not fear. Because, see, it, it's real easy to say, well, don't worry about it. You know, what was that one song? Don't worry, be happy. Or, or just, just don't be fearful. No, we've got something to base that on, and that basis gives us, the basis of no fear or not fearing gives us contentment. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What's the fear? What's the fear? So keep that in mind. Just keep those few things in mind. The next time you turn on the news and you hear all those fearful things going on, but you're not to have that spirit of fear because God is greater than all of that. The next time you fear when maybe you balance your checkbook and you see the bottom line, God is greater than that. The next time your kids go upside down or the next time you fill in the blank, maybe a job issue, whatever it might be. Now, don't be ignorant of it. Those feelings of fear should drive us to prayer as we recognize who the one who is able to take care of it. But again, realize that it's God, that God, the God that we've looked at here in Isaiah and over in Psalms, that watches over you and keeps you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Next, well, first we were told to fear not. Next, we are told to thirst not. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offspring. They will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses. One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of the Lord. Thirst not? Well, again, in verse 3, I will pour water on him who's thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit. The idea is being saturated with the Holy Spirit. Just as truly as if I took a bucket of water and dumped it over your head, first you'd be mad or irritated anyway, but secondly, you'd be wet. You'd be wet, you'd be wet to the bone. My granddaughter, um, Mariah, I think it was Friday, decided she was going to run through the neighbor's sprinklers. She came back home to our house, Mariah's six, just turned six, and she was saturated to the bone. What were you doing? So God is going to 
lavish his love and his spirit upon us to that degree that you're going to be saturated. What this is, is a dual claim of possession. First is God's claim of possession for you. He will saturate you with his seal. The Holy Spirit is this way that we have been sealed by God. We're told this in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In him, in Jesus Christ, you also trusted after you heard the truth, the gospel of your salvation. So somewhere along the line, somebody spoke the gospel to you. And God did a work within your heart, and you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You trusted him for your salvation. After you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So at that moment of, of salvation, you were sealed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The idea is the Holy Spirit took up residence inside of you. Now, there's three purposes, three reasons in which something is sealed. First, a seal is used to confirm an object or a document as being true or genuine. God sealed you so that you would know that you are a genuine believer. And so, there's the conviction of sin. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the conscience, the ear for the Holy Spirit. As you're being directed in your life, the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to direct you in the ways of holiness, righteousness, and just in the routines of your life as well. If you looked at a dollar bill in your wallet, it carries the seal of the Department of the Treasury. That little seal that is there, it gives you a confidence that you know that piece of paper has value. If you could see the Holy Spirit within you or somebody else, you would see the value that that person has in the sight of God. He has sealed you as being true and genuine, a true born-again believer. This being the case, if the devil tries to convince you otherwise, you see the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. The Holy Spirit as he has given you understanding in God's word. The Holy Spirit as he's given you a recognition and a conviction of what sin is. The Holy Spirit, as he gives you a desire, because it's not something that man naturally does, a desire for God and for God's word. And again, these are things that we hold on to and cling to because they've been given, a, given to us by God for the purpose of establishing us as being genuine believers. Secondly, a seal is used to mark something as a person's property. Most of you have the inside of your Bible cover. I've got one right here. I'll show it to you because a long time ago, and I don't know why I don't just throw it away, it came out. But it says who it's been presented to and presented by. This seals this Bible as being mine. Matter of fact, I had somebody redo my cover, and he put on the front, Pastor Mike Ursioli. This is sealed as being mine. If you see it, you know whose it is because of that seal that is there. And again, looking down upon a, per, a, a, a person... They've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. It speaks of possession, that you are no longer your own, but now you are God's. My children are sealed with attributes of myself and my wife, as my grandchildren are as well. As you look upon them and you see those attributes, you know whose kids they are, even though we deny it. There's no denying. And then a seal is used to make something fast or secure. In Revelation chapter 7, there's 144,000 Jews from every tribe that were sealed by God. And then as you go through the tribulation, there's Christ standing on the Mount of Olives, and with him are 143,000, no, not 143,000, there's 144,000. As God sealed each one of them, God was able to keep every one of them. They made it through that dreadful time of tribulation. Why? because they were safely sealed by God. So we are to fear not, we are to thirst not, and then we are to stray not. Verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. For those people that come preaching other gods or multiple gods or whatever, we're entering in, well, actually we did last week, to the section of Scripture that God uses and very clear that there is no God but Him. Verse 7, And who can 
proclaim as I do, and let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear, do not be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declare it? You are my witness. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. And again, if you underline verses, add these to your collection. A uh, previous one we, we looked at was in chapter 43. It was last week, verse 11. Even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. And so God is speaking of the reality of who he is, and there are absolutely no others. Stray not in your understanding of the existence of God, the reality of God, and the ability of God. Why? Because our society no longer gets this. They no longer understand or get the existence of God. They've chosen to ignore it. They no longer get the reality of God. They have chosen to go according to their own direction. They no longer understand the abilities of God they're basing everything, decisions and all, based upon man's ability. And because of this, we are a nation such as we are today. Verse 8, we see the identity of God. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declare it? You are my witnesses. Actually, I'm sorry, it's verse 6. Thus says the Lord God, <clears throat> the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, but besides me, there is no God. And we see in these verses that God is king, he is savior, and he is Lord of the armies of heaven. God is all-powerful and, again, mighty to save. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first, and I am the last. He was there at the beginning, and he'll be there at the end. He's the first, he's the first word, and he's the last word on everything. This is the God who watches over us. This is the God who keeps us. Verse 7, we see the intention of God. And who can proclaim as I do? Let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming shall come, let them show these to them. The intention of God is through his revelation to keep for his people. So again, it all goes back to, again, these prophecies that we see. The intention of God was to speak of the future and the prophecies that were to come and the realities of what God was going to do so that today we can have an assurance in his word and the things that have been promised in the future. So the events of today, everything that goes on in your life today is all predicated upon God's plan working out all the way through to the future. Verse 8, we see the instruction of God. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declare it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed. <clears throat> there is no other rock. I know not one. 1 Corinthians 10.4, And all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so again, God establishing the reality of who he is during fearful times. If you have a spirit of fear, I can tell you just to not fear, but that's kind of silly. I've got to base it upon something. I've got to base it upon God. But what happens when a society takes God out? That's exactly what he addresses next. He addresses in verses 9 through 20. He's speaking of the false gods, the false idols. And again, those are anything that comes between man in a right relationship with God. We can make anything an idol, or we can make any person an idol. Verse 9, those who make an image, all of them are useless. They're unable to do anything for man or his situation. And their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing? He's speaking of how ridiculous it is. Surely all of his companions would be ashamed, and the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed. So God just said, fear not, but these people, these are the, the creators of these gods. He says, they need to be fearful. Verse 12, the blacksmith with the tongs works one in the coals. 
fashions it with hammers and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. And so speaking of this man who is creating this idol, he's creating this idol based upon his own limited strength. Verse 13, the craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one out with the chalk. He fastens it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass and makes it like the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself and takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself amongst the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and then rain nourishes it. So he's speaking of this raw material. But where did the raw material come from? And again, God who created everything, well, where did all of his creation come from? Well, when we're told God created the heavens and the earth, all of that raw material, God spoke it into existence. These people who make their God, what are they doing? They're taking that which God first has provided and then making their false gods from that. Verse 15, Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself, Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. Verse 16, he burns half of it in the fire. And with this half he eats meat. He roasts the roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. His carved image, he falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Now, what's the big issue here? I mean, obviously it's obvious, but what it boils down to, you put your trust in, let's say, a better case scenario than just a carved image, we'll say a person. You put your trust in a person and you're able to receive from that person whatever that person is able to give. We know in comparison to God that it's very little. It's actually nothing in comparison to God. But let's just say that person provides you with some sort of sense of security for a period of time. The problem is there's going to come that day when that person's going to die. And just as surely as he's talking about here with this man who, who takes this piece of wood, and if that was truly a god, then the wood would be divine, but then where does it end up? It ends up as being ash. Now, I, I reject ISIS and everything they did. Don't get me wrong on this, but did you see what happened to those gods that they destroyed? Their heads fell off. They were able to smash him with hammer. Those were worshipped as gods at one point. And his point is, it's all going to burn. It's all going to turn to ash. And then, if your god turns to ash, if your god breaks, if your god is destroyed, then what's going to happen to you? You better be very fearful. Verse 18, They do not know nor understand, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge, nor understanding to say, they're not looking at it clearly with common sense, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes a deceived heart and turned him aside. He cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand looking at this idol and so we're told in ecclesiastes that god has put eternity in our hearts man is going to worship something somehow this is how god has created us and again we need to be and i kind of speak preaching to the choir here but you got to be mindful of he who you're worshiping if you're worshiping a musician if you're worshiping prince what happened he died where are you at when your musician dies remember john lennon he, he died, he was murdered, but he died, and there were thousands of people were holding vigils for him across the world. But John Lennon couldn't do anything for himself, let alone anything for anybody else. And the same for any man, and I'm not even putting them down so much. Um, I'm just simply speaking of man's ability or anything's ability to provide for you to the magnitude that God has provided for you. Has anybody ever prayed to God and had him answer prayer? Have you asked somebody to help you and they've ever let you down? I've never seen that with God. I've never seen God's people breaking bread. I've never seen God's people into despair to the point that God has rejected them. It's not going to happen. It never has and it, it never will. 
And so again, all of these things are building on that foundation that God's people aren't to have a spirit of fear. And so there's going to come the day, assuming God tarries, of your death. You're not to be fearful of that. And if you are raptured and the tribulation comes, you're not to be fearful on that. You're not to be fearful of these things because the best case scenario in every issue is always God. And the thing about it is he's always, if you will, the worst case scenario. He's what it is all about. He's our all and all. And as we have trust in the living God, I have hope for today. I have hope for today and hope for tomorrow. And, and, and if that's the case, I'm going to have a confidence in, in, in this life. And, and again, as I see these things that are difficult to comprehend, that are going on worldwide today, it does matter. I am to pray and I'm to minister. But again, I have a contentment in God and who God is. So we are to form not. And then lastly, we are to forget him not. Verses 21 through 23. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servants. I have formed you. There's that word, I believe, for the third time. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains. O forest and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. So God has done these great things that he's spoken of in verses 21 and 23. Verse, I'm sorry, 21 and 22. Verse 23, he confirms it with the revelation of who he is. Again, the one who is powerful enough to create those mountains that are there, to create the human body, he focused that power in the redemption of your soul. And because of this, we're to have a great assurance in this present life. And so, think of the things that get you down. Think of the fears that so easily enter into your life. God has gone before you. He's all-knowing. He's ever-present. He's all-powerful. He's holy. And He cares for your soul. He cares for your soul to such a degree that He had a desire to bring it unto Himself for eternity that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. What is it that we worry about? What is it that is greater? What is it that is able to overshadow that? Nothing unless we allow it to. Father, I do pray that we would be a people, especially in this coming week, that we would stand strong in the reality of your word, that, Lord, these things we would hold dear to ourselves and realize, God, that as you are for us, there's nobody that can be against us. Father, there's many gods that mankind has formed, many directions that he has gone, but there's only one true God. And Father, as we look at the landscape, even of our nation, and we see how man is turning away from you, I pray, Father, that we would stand strong in your truth. Because, Father, ultimately, as man develops those gods and those gods fail him, there's opportunity in that. And so, Father, may we be counted faithful this week. Lord, I lift up those who have come out tonight. I pray that you would bless them, that you would go before them. And again, we would have that mindset that we are entering into what you have prepared for us. Because of that, Father, we just rejoice in your holiness. We rejoice in the attributes of who you are, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand, please? Keep up in prayer. Thursday is when I'm going to be doing Anne's mother's funeral, um, Annette.